for people who don't know, we have a tradition of giving Max bottles of cheap whiskey at this conference. Um, this is not a cheap whiskey, actually. This is actually nicer yeah. than we would normally give him. So, but that comes from one of his his questions, his fun facts from the early conferences. So, and he's actually probably has too much whiskey for me. But you know, we'll, we're we're going to keep giving it to you until you just fill your whole house. Thank you very much, Max, for being here. Yeah, right. The the one virtual conference is when they choose to give out the good alcohol to me. So, thanks for that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about maybe un surprising nobody uh, resampling a little bit, but a little different uh, spin on it, looking at more um, not machine learning models and so more inferential models um, specifically related to like repeated measures. Uh, the slides are here. There's a link at the very end if you want to um, get them. So I'll, I'll mostly be thinking about multi-level models. So multi-level models like a catch-all for things like hierarchical linear models, like hierarchical Bayesian models, uh, mixed effects, random effects, random coefficient models, split plots. It's like a, a whole host of models sort of fall into this sort of category. Um, the important things about them and why people typically use them is uh, we very often have like what I would call an independent experimental unit in a data set. And in most data sets, every row is like the experimental unit that's independent of the other rows. But you might have other um, data where, for example, in the example I'll use, um, we collect data over time on a person. So whereas people are independent, uh, the rows within people are dependent because they're coming from the same person. And typically multi-level models are used for those particular situations to account for subject to subject variation or correlation within subject. Um, and another reason they use them, and this is important for the talk, is that a lot of times if you have an experiment and you go to make some inferences about, let's say, a group of um, subjects or a group of something, um, if you don't use like a multi-level model, most of your inferences are confined to the uh, specific, let's say, subjects that were in your data set. And so the nice thing about like random effects models and, and Bayesian models is your inferences can be then, if you use those, uh, generalized to a broader set, like the population of those experimental units. And so that's one reason that people typically use them. Um, so in my analysis here, I'm going to focus on uh, this linear mix models. Um, I feel that they're inferior to Bayesian hierarchical models, but they're a lot faster. So I'm going to be doing some resampling. Um, I've tested what I'm going to talk about um, also with like R stand arm and some other Bayesian methods. And I've also tested it across like three different data sets. I'm beginning sort of the same result. So, um, so what I'll show you here has been repeatable for me across models and data sets. Um, so let me show you an example from my last job when I was in drug discovery. Uh, we had a lot of laboratory data. I mean, we had like, like a crazy amount of laboratory data over decades. And one of the important things we would do in early drug discovery is try to get a like a like just an idea of what human clearance might be. So human clearance is when you ingest a drug or you're injected or whatever, clearance is basically the rate that it leaves your body. So whether you metabolize it or you um, excrete it during, via urine or something like that, it's like how fast is a drug getting out of your body? And that's a really, it's like probably one of the most critical things you can measure um, in a drug. And so we had a bunch of laboratory tests where we would, um, with a specific type of cells, put uh, a fixed concentration of drug in them and then monitor them over time to figure out um, how fast they eliminate. So we had like these very large number of like repeated measures designs, like longitudinal data on, a, so there the experimental unit would be a drug or what we would call a compound. And so the most important, uh, so this is simulated data here on the left. This data looks remarkably like close to the kind of data that we were analyzing at the time. It was somewhat noisy, but linear. Um, the most important things that we would get from a, a model and an analysis like this would be, for an individual compound, it would be the slope because the slope is very, it was like, I think it's like one divided by the half-life, or the half-life is one divided by the slope, I think. Um, so on a compound to compound basis, we were really interested in knowing what the uh, slopes were from these experiments. But if we build a model or did some analysis, we'd have to report to the users of the analysis and their management what the error rate was for the model. So if this is like a linear regression or a complicated linear regression, we'd have to report like the root mean squared error. And then when we needed something that was like an overall way to um, characterize how well the model was doing, 
so that they could, when they use it, you know, feel confident was doing what they thought um, it should be doing. And so the focus of this talk is really going to be about estimating the error rates of models, um, especially models that have um, uh, mixed or uh, multiple levels. So uh, I am going to adhere to what seems like the new conference norm of uh, doing uh, a single uh, visualization per slide. So uh, we have the Teddy models infrastructure. So that includes like recipes and parse and things like that. We also have like an add-on package that we haven't released yet. It's on GitHub. And what multi-level mod does is it extends uh, our parsenet package to using like um, uh, LME4 package for doing modeling. Uh, we already use like our stain arm, but we would enable our stain arm to work across um, hierarchies like multiple levels and things like that. So when you load this package, it adds some more engines to the uh, parsenet package. The data set that I'll use, uh, it's actually quite an old data set. And it's actually, I think the first time I saw was in like SAS documentation. Uh, but it's a clinical trial. Uh, there's 66 subjects. Their outcome is a depression score. So this is like a standardized score that people use to measure depression. Um, and then the data is collected over a week. So there's four weeks at zero base, like zero, one, two, three. And then uh, there's a uh, uh, indicator for uh, sex. There's another, ind another indicator for the presence of this endogenous, I think it was a protein. And then we have two uh, columns that are time-dependent covariates. So these are covariates uh, that change every time point. Um, and so these will be a little bit important as the analysis goes on. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to model the depression score as a function of week and all these other factors. So how would we do that, for example, in a multiple, multiple level model? So one of the most common things we can do is just build like a linear regression model, but with the exception of uh, these first two terms here. So what this would do is it's what we call a random intercept model, where we have an overall like global population intercept uh, for the depression score. And then the I here is over subjects. So each subject would get its own specific intercept in the model so that we have some specificity per subject. And then we do the same thing with the slope. So the slope has a global population slope, and then each individual subject has their own contribution to that slope. Um, so it's a random uh, slope and intercept model. Now we have other parameters that are more typical where we don't have subject effects like related to sex and all the other um, columns in the data set, including the uh, metabolites that were in there. So when we go to fit this, um, I'm gonna use LME4 uh, package and the limmer function. And so when you load that extra parsenet package, you can set the engine to be limmer. Uh, we also have an engine uh, for Stan Glimmer, which uses R Stan Arm. Um, and so that's something else you could do. Now, we're working on the interface for how to specify the model formula. And this is going to look a little bit kludgy. And here's a link to a better, slightly better interface that we think will make this easier to use if you want to take a look at it. But what you do uh, in Tiny Models is you would create what we call a model workflow. And a model workflow consists of a, a model like a parsenet model object, and then some type of preprocessor. And that preprocessor could be you know, a formula or a recipe or something like that. And so the confusing part here is we're gonna have two formulas. So the, the thing about the model formula in R is it, it's really like overloaded with things that it does. For models like, um, like a generalized additive model or um, a mixed effects model like we're gonna use, the, uh, the model formula not only tells you know, the, the common R infrastructure like model out matrix, like what um, column should be in the data and how to encode them. In this particular case, it encodes also statistical information. So this formula that I have above here that has the random intercept and in, uh, slope model is really specified by a model formula that we would give to Limmer. And that says, you know, we have weak as an effect and this little bit of it says the weak should be uh, a random effect with random intercepts and slopes. And then we have ordinary sort of uh, coefficients for these other models. So what you would do is your formula here would basically have the outcome, tilde, and dot. And, and what, what tidy models would know to do for this particular type of model is not take a uh, subject, for example, and make dummy variables out of it, because then that would be not really usable by uh, the limmer function. So this formula here is really more about like data preprocessing. processing 
And then when you add the model to the workflow, you can add an additional model formula. And this model formula gets passed directly to Limmer or, or Stan Arm or whatever package or um, function that you're using within the analysis package. So it's like two levels of formulas. Um, and again, we think we'll have a better way of doing that in this PR. But once that's specified, then it's really simple. It just uses the fit function, you give it the data set, and you get your model back. Uh, so let's look at that real quick. That's my dog snoring behind me, if you can hear that, sorry. When we print the fitted model, it's basically what you would get if you would use the model directly. Um, the things I'll point out in the model I put here is the residual. So this uh, 3.25 is the estimate of the root mean squared error of this particular model. Um, it's used by basically repredicting the training set and calculating what the RMC is. Um, generally, we don't think that's a great idea, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, it tells you, for example, there are random effects due to the intercept and the slope, and then it calls them fixed effects, but they're really like the population parameters for this model. So across all the subjects, the average slope for the population would be about, about negative two. Um, the intercept on average is about 1.3. And so that's the output that we would get. So this is pretty straightforward. The only you know change here is how we would fit this using Teddy models. So you know I said we'd have like you know one plot per page and I'm sticking to that, but it's it's you know it's like a wall of a data here. Um, so when we look at the model fit um, by repredicting the data set uh, with all the subjects, we see for the most part, most of these lines are pretty close to the original like observed data. Um, there's some case where they bend a little bit, and this would be a situation where, for example, um, those time-dependent covariates for the uh, metabolites ha are having a big effect on the model. Uh, you see there are some subjects like three or five here that has, you know, a pretty a pretty uh, uh, negative slope. We do have some like 113 or 360 that are bordering on, you know, low positive slopes. So we do see some variation in the slopes here. Um, so, you know, all in all, I think we'd look at this model and say, yeah, that's coming pretty close to the data and might feel that it's sufficient. Um, but here's the question that I want to know is, and this is more motivated by the types of problems I used to work on is, well, how would this model fit for a new subject? So, you know, we know, at least from machine learning, that uh, if we take the same data that was used to fit our model and repredict it and measure model performance from it, you know, on average, those models tend to be, or those model performance estimates tend to be optimistic. So just repredicting the training set, even though we can get like a root mean squared error, it might not be a very good estimate of uh, root mean squared error because there's a lot of things baked into the data that might not reflect what would happen on new subjects. So what I'll spend the rest of the time doing is talking about what would happen with new subjects. So, you know, as I mentioned previously, um, I'd really be focused on what the error estimate is, like the root mean squared error. And some people might be saying, well, like, well, don't we don't really use that. We use like uh, information criteria statistics like AIC or BIC. But I'm not really worried about model comparisons here. I'm really worried about you know, having to communicate to the end user of a model like this what the error rate is. And it's in the units that they know about. So they tend to be able to interpret it pretty well. In this particular case, I don't think AIC or BIC is really what they'd be interested in, um, even though it's, you know, it's a penalized version um, based on the number of parameters relative to the number of data points of so the likelihood. I think they really would much rather have a, an RMSC. So our sort of in-model estimate or, uh, is 3.25. And so the question is, what would happen if we had a new sample, like a new subject? So what we would do is use, for example, one thing we could do is do leave one out, leave one subject out cross validation. And so we have 66 subjects. So we would fit 66 different models. The first model takes out, you know, the first subject and fits the model on the remaining 65, and then predicts that one held out subjects data and computes the RMC from that. And then you would just go round robin through all of the subjects and get 66 uh, estimates of RMSE that are relative to each subject. And so typically with resampling, what we do is we take the average of our resampling estimates and use that as our generalization error. So if we take the average of those 66 uh, RMSE values, that should be indicative of what we would see for uh, new samples, for new subjects. And it turns out in tiny models, that's really easy. 
uh, we have a, a control object we'll set that will save the prediction so we can show some more uh, plots. We already have a function that can do leave subject out. We would give it, uh, give this group V fold CV function, the uh, data set, and then the column that corresponds to the, um, the uh, experimental unit, which is subject here. And then our re uh, fit resamples function is already designed to do resampling. Um, it doesn't do any model tuning or anything. It just like resamples the same model across different um, uh, objects that are created by the R sample um, package. So the result of this is a tibble that has all the, you know, leave one out information in it. Um, as you'll see in a minute, there's a, um, a function called collect metrics and collect metrics will then add to the averaging of the 66 and show you what the, the um, overall RMC is. And so when we look at that, again, remember our benchmark for the in sample RMC estimate is 3.25. And then when we do that, surprise Pikachu, um, we get that and it's, the leave subject out estimate is almost twice as high. So, in, you know, instead of three, and, and so here on this um, visualization is the in sample estimate. Here's the estimate when we leave them out. And then the rug plot here shows what the individual RMSEs are. And you can see some of them are like fivefold larger than the original. So, uh, or the original in sample. So, you know, I was quite taken aback by this and thought, wow, I'm really surprised that it's that bad. Um, very often when you take like a pretty simple high bias model, low variance model like linear regression and resample it, usually uh, the resample performance estimates are at least within the ballpark of the, um, the one that uses reprediction. Um, that's not true of many other models, but it's usually true of linear regression. And so I was very kind of surprised by this. And, and so the rest of the talk is like, um, sort of a, the summary of how I figured out that I didn't make a mistake, I believe. Um, so let's talk about, you know, how this happened. Why, are, why is performance so bad when we leave a subject out? And so to talk about that, we should talk about how we do actual estimation, both in the model and how the model is being used for prediction when you're using a multi-level model. So, it, you know, as we said before, each subject has their own specific uh, slope and intercept. And so when we have that slope and intercept, um, what we do, or the way the model works, is it basically um, uh, does something called shrinkage or partial pooling, depending on what sort of school you're coming from. And what it does is if you were to take the individual slope and intercept um, estimates by just fitting a bunch of separate models for each subject, um, what the partial pooling and shrinkage does is it sort of shrinks them down towards the average. So it's shrinking them towards like the population estimate of the slope and the intercept. And that's sort of visualized. So for example, like this one subject here had a relatively um, negative intercept. And, and that's when you just fit it using just that subject's data. But in the multi-level model, they had shrunken way, way closer to the population average of intercepts. And you see the same thing happens with slopes. And so, you know, we're, we're already shrinking them towards, and this is basically regularization, um, we're shrinking them so that we get generally better parameter estimates, at least having statistical properties that are better. Um, so that's what happens inside the model. The main reason I bring this up is because in order to do this within the model, you need the actual slopes and intercepts, and you can't compute the slopes and intercepts unless you have the, the actual holdout data, like the outcome data. So in this case, we can't do this for the depression, for data where we don't have the depression scores. So in sample, we have everything we need to do the shrinkage on a subject by subject basis. But think about when we predict a new sample, we want to know what their outcome data are. We don't necessarily have it. And so how does the, how do these types of models deal with a situation where they're making predictions on a subject where we don't know what their outcome is? So looking at these populations of slope and intercepts, what we typically do when we fit these models is we realize they're coming from a population and we, you know, if we are pre-specified a distribution that we think that they come from. So when we have a new data point, what we typically do is, uh, depending on how the models fit, we get the distribution of these parameters and basically use the, the population value, which is some estimate of the middle of the subject specific effects. So if you're fitting like linear uh, or a linear mixed model, this would be the average basically of the um, coefficients. If you're doing a Bayesian model, it would be the mode of the distribution um, and so on. So what happens is in sample, 
when we're making a prediction about a subject that was used in the model fit, they have their own subject specific slopes and intercepts because that's how the model works. But when we have a new subject coming in, they don't have subject specific uh, coefficients available to them. And so they use the overall population estimate to make the predictions. So they still have all these other covariates that are, are used the same as they would have been, but the actual random effects are not random effects anymore because we don't have data to, to compute the subject specific parts. So basically what this means is across week, uh, all of our new samples are starting off with the exact same slope and intercept, whether, whether that's appropriate or not. So now let's look at those model fits when we held out the data. So on these curves, the dotted line are the original in-sample predictions, and the solid lines are the predictions that are coming when this particular subject was held out. And so you can see for subject 101 here, you know, the intercept is maybe not off by that much, but definitely the slope is, is you know, not so hot. Um, there's some like down here, 360, where, you know, we thought that previously we had a, you know, maybe zero or slightly positive slope here, but we're constrained by the, the way we do prediction to have a negative slope. So, you know, if we're looking for the subjects that had a, a five-fold higher RMSE compared to the in-sample prediction, this is exactly what's going on. So we have a number of um, subjects here whose predicted value is nowhere near the observed data points, uh, whereas many of them are. So, for example, if we take subject 350 over here, we can see that those fits are right on top of each other. And that's because its original slope and intercept from the mixed level model was very much in the middle of that population. So, you know, this wasn't like a bug in code. This is a real thing um, about, and it's much, very much related to how we make predictions for these types of models. And it does make me think of it being basically a product of what we call information leakage. So information leakage is the idea that, um, the idea that um, when you're making a prediction on a new sample, you shouldn't be dipping into the raw data of the original data set to make predictions. And so it's, it basically leads to a type of bias that could artificially make your predictions look better than they actually are. So we tend to want to make predictions on new data and keep those very, um, very much confined and quarantined. We don't want to um, have the original training set enter into it. And so when we make predictions, uh, in sample predictions from these types of models, they're very much have information leakage because they're using the outcome of the data to then predict the outcome data. And you don't have that with new data points. And it's a little bit problematic because if you think about why we use these types of models, we use them because they generalize well, like in inference. So when we when we make inferences about you know the effect of weak um, over time on depression, we want to make that inference to the larger population of subjects. We don't want to say, well, for these 66 subjects, here's what happened. And so if our generalization error for these types of models is very large compared to their in-sample error, it does make you wonder about the, the um, quality of our inference um, in terms of um, generalization. Uh, when one caveat to this, and I, I mentioned I tried this on a bunch of different data sets and saw the same patterns, but if you did have strong time, vary, time varying covariates, for example, like the uh, metabolites that I mentioned, then this wouldn't really happen so much because you'd be diminishing the effect of, uh, let's say, slope and intercept, and you would have other terms in the model that would dominate, and your predictions would be better, whether it's in sample or out of sample. So this isn't like guaranteed to happen for every linear mixed model or hierarchical model. It depends on the covariates and how they're entered in the model. But anyway, it was an interesting uh, phenomenon that I um, observed and I thought I'd share with everybody. So thanks, and uh, slides are right here if you want them. Thank you, Max. And uh, that concludes Dr. Hour. Before we head to our break,